I hope this finds you well. Uh, we are getting ready to start time period three. Um, hopefully you're not getting tired of these because if you are, we're in trouble because I got six more to go after this one. Today we are looking at the time periods between, let me get to it, uh, uh, 1754 to 1800. Um, What's going to happen, guys, in this time period, or starting with this point in history, we're going to start looking at history by the decades. Not, you know, a 50-year period or anything. We're going 10 years at a time. And that's honestly how I would recommend studying. Now, when it comes to studying, there is one thing I want to point out before we get started. A couple different sources you can use. I haven't talked much about Hip Hughes history. But this guy is great. He has a fantastic website. You can see it here, uh, w, or hiphughshistory.weebly.com. I think you can see it up there at the top. If you do a search online, it'll take you right to it. Um, this is the guy that's going to be doing the, uh, the video with us uh, on Thursday night. He's going to be doing that with Tom Ritchie. But when you come up here to the top, let me see if I can get to it, um, the video arsenal. Click on that. Scroll down and you can click right there on U.S. History. And I'm just going to scroll quickly through all the different videos he has here. Um, just about everything that we talk about in U.S. History, he has a video on and gives great explanations of all of this. So if there's a specific area or something like that that you're not comfortable with, I definitely recommend going to, to Hip Hughes and uh, checking out his video arsenal. Of course, you can also go to Tom Ritchie's website. I, you know, you guys know I use him a lot and everything, and so there's a lot of stuff on here as well. You can pretty much hit uh, most of his videos and stuff. There's a link here that will take you to his YouTube channel where you can see uh, all the different videos he's made. So these are two different teachers that uh, present the same topics, so find one that basically keeps you uh, engaged, I guess is the best way I can put it. But for now, basically what we're gonna do now is we are going to start into, I gotta fix that because, whoa. Um, we're gonna go into period three, 1754 to 1800. A lot to cover. We're gonna get into the time of the revolution. We're gonna go into um, the new republic, writing our new constitution, the presidency and how that's established. All that happens between these years. So just a little background. We, we didn't talk a lot about the French-Indian War on the previous video, but we really don't need to. Um, we know that, that we fought in this war. It was also known as the Seven Years War. So you might see that, that those uh, names interchanged on the AP exam, either the French-Indian War or the Seven Years War. England is going to w end up winning that war, and because of that, we're going to see the land that's available to us beyond the Appalachian Mountains. Basically, the land holdings of England now in North America go from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Mississippi River. Uh, the colonists did fight alongside the English in this war, so they're going to expect some of the rewards that come from that, that, that war as well. But there's going to be some problems that England's going to have to deal with because while we have had lived in a time period of salutary neglect up until this point, we've also lived under the protection of England. And so I guess we wanted our cake and we wanted to eat it too. So what we're going to see now is that salutary neglect is going to go away as well as the changing of the, I guess, the protection. Who, we're going to question who is England really protecting here in the colonies. So let's just get right into it. We're going to start with the 1760s. I refer to this time period as the age of protest. So if you just remember that the 60s were the age of protest, <clears throat> you can also synthesize that to the 1960s because that too was an age of protest in our country. So that's a great way to, to synthesize, you know, same in kind but different in time when it comes time to write your essays. So when we look at the 1760s, basically it all starts with Pontiac's War in 1763. This is a war that's going to be fought. Uh, Native Americans are going to band together and start attacking uh, settlers and forts throughout the Ohio River Valley. And what ends up happening is the, the English basically install what's known as the Proclamation Line of 1763. 
And the proclamation line basically sets a boundary along the Appalachian Mountains that says that settlers cannot go west of that line because England just simply can't protect the settlers there. They, the Native Americans are, are very restless at this point. And so basically what England does is say, hey, Native Americans, you, you can have that land there. We're going to keep the colonists on this side of the line. Well, that's going to upset the colonists because obviously they fought in the war. And like I told you, they want to share in the spoils of war. And part of those spoils is this great fertile land beyond the Appalachian Mountains. And expansion is a big idea. In, in American history and it really starts right here with a lot of the colonists wanting to expand beyond the Appalachian Mountains. The other problem that's going to come during this time period is England is going to have a lot of debt and to pay off that debt they're going to look to the colonies to basically foot the bill for their protection over here and they're going to start charging them taxes. It starts basically, let me get to the, to the year because I want to give you the right year, 1764 the Currency Act. Um, that's going to followed by, be followed by the Quartering Act. And when not only are you going to pay taxes on currency, you're going to have to you know, quarter the soldiers, keep them in your homes. Uh, that's going to be followed by 1765, the Stamp Act. It is from the Stamp Act that the phrase, no taxation without representation, comes. And so that's where you also get the Stamp Act Congress. They come together basically to appeal to the crown and ask them to pull back this tax. They ask for representation in parliament. And, you know, we start to see a lot of, um, I guess, um, peaceful protests in the sense that the Daughters of Liberty are gonna be formed. They're gonna start boycotting a lot of English goods. And then you have some non-peaceful protests starting to form with the Sons of Liberty. And that's when you start seeing some of this tarring and feathering going on during this time period. Also, after, after the, uh, the Stamp Act, we, what we're going to see is that's going to be repealed in 1766. But what that's going to be followed with is the Declaratory Act. And the Declaratory Act, Declaratory Act basically says this. England can pass any law they want to because the colonies are the property of England. And the colonists can't do anything about it. You just got to live with it. And so this is going to lead to more and more protests. And, you know, and so that's going to lead to the next tax, which is the Townsend Act. 1767, the Townsend Act is passed, which is basically a tax on everything. They're going to tax tea. They're going to tax glass. They're going to tax paint and lead and paper. All of this is basically going to show that this tax affects all the colonists. When we look back at the Stamp Act, that was just a tax on legal documents or printed documents. Well, now the Townsend Act, this is what's going to lead to a little bit more of a revolt, if you will, from the colonists. And that's going to lead us into the 1770s, the time period I refer to as the Age of Bloodshed, which, you know, if you know when this Re Revolutionary War starts, it makes sense. But it really starts, honestly, in 1770 in Boston with the Boston Massacre. The Boston Massacre is showing us there is signs of trouble ahead. Five men were killed. Um, the, the, the name you need to know here is Crispus Attucks. Crispus Attucks was a freed uh, slave who um, was the first one killed in this attack. And the other name you need to know from this is Paul Revere. Paul Revere is going to basically create a, a uh, graphic of the, the attack and we talked about it in class, and this picture is going to go throughout all the colonies talking about the bloodshed in Boston at this point. Um, one more name that you can pull from this is John Adams. Haven't talked a lot about John Adams yet. He actually defends the soldiers, successfully defends the soldiers who carried out the Boston, who fired the, the shots for the Boston Massacre. Now, think back, we, we still have the, the T Act in place based on the Townsend Act. And then what happens is you see that a monopoly is being formed with the British East India Company, where England rules that you can only buy tea from that company. This is going to lead to the Boston Tea Party, in which you had a lot of the, uh, the Sons of Liberty dress up as Mohawk Indians, and they're gonna go dump all the tea in the harbor. 
Well, since the government basically oversees the, the East India Tea uh, uh, sh uh, Trading Company, this is their tea that is being dumped into the harbor. So they re demand uh, financial retribution. They want to be paid for the tea that was destroyed. And so what they do is and until that is, that is paid for, they issue the Intolerable Acts. The Intolerable Acts were issued in 1774. They're also known as the Coercive Acts. Again, another name that's interchangeable, the Townsend Acts and the Coercive Acts. And basically, I have it listed there. That's the Boston Port Act, which basically closed Boston Harbor to any ships coming in or going out. It included the Massachusetts Government Act, making it illegal for any of the local legislatures to meet. The Administration of Justice Act was also passed, the Quartering Act, and the Quebec Act. And we talked about the Quebec Act, how basically they were bringing in um, Quebec as, as a new region for England, and yet they were getting a lot of rights up there that they weren't getting in the colonies. This is going to lead to the first Continental Congress meeting. There are two Continental Congress. You have the First Continental Congress and the Second Continental Congress. The First Continental Congress is going to meet and they are going to draft the Declaration of Rights and Grievances. And they are going to send those to England, hoping that what will happen is that King George will repeal the Intolerable Acts and basically they can get back to the status quo. They're not looking for their independence at this point. So just keep that in mind. That's going to come later. In fact, the, you know, when we look at this timeline, you can see basically a breakdown of everything that happened. And it all started in 1763 with the proclamation line. Um, and the Coercive Acts is going to be the bookend on the other end. The Coercive Acts, like we've talked about, they just affected the city of Boston. And um, because of that, a lot of the other colonies aren't so willing to get behind this idea of, uh, of a revolution. You, have, you know, the, 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 the heartbeat of the revolutionary movement is in Boston at this time. So it's difficult at first to convince the other colonies that they should get involved in a possible war with England when it's only one city that's being affected. So that's going to be, you know, that's going to be a lot of the debate, honestly, in the Second Continental Congress. And when we look at the Second Continental Congress, they met basically in 1775. It really started with the Battle of Lexington and Concord. The British troops were, you had colonists amassing arms and weapons throughout the Massachusetts countryside, specifically in Lexington and Concord. You also had people like Paul Revere and John Hancock, who the English had decided was stirring up the problems. So what you what you had was you had the the there was basically a warrant, if you will, issued for some of the Sons of Liberty, and um, the English went looking for them as well as the weapons. They are going to meet up with the Minutemen in Lexington, and the first shots of the uh, of the American Revolution are, are fired. In fact, that's what's referred to as a shot that was heard around the world. No country, no colony has ever revolted against their mother country. So when we talk about the shot here heard around the world, that's symbolic of the magnitude of what's about to happen. The Second Continental Congress meets. They want one more try at peace, and so that's when they send the Olive Branch Petition to King George. And basically the Olive Branch Petition basically was said to George, hey, let's just get back to the way things were prior to the proclamation line. If we could just go back, you know there's that meme out there where you can hit the reset button. If we can just go back to 1763, all will be well and we'll be happy. King George says no way. And, and, and this is going to lead to the Continental Congress starting to debate the Declaration of Independence. It's also going to lead to more confrontations between the colonial army and um, England, the English army. The pr uh, big one is at Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill is a loss for the colonists. However, it was a, it was a loss in the sense that they lost the battle. But it was a moral victory because of the damage and the casualty numbers they inflicted on the English army. It's like kind of like they're saying, hey, we can stand up to these guys and, and we can do well. So 1775 really marks the beginning of the American Revolution.
1776, the Second Continental Congress is still meeting. This is when they draft the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence was drafted by Thomas Jefferson and a committee that included also included Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, uh, Roger Sherman, and uh, I want to say Edmund Randolph, but I couldn't. Nah, I don't think that's right. But um, but the pre predominant players here are Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin. They are, or I should say, Jefferson is inspired by John Locke. We talked about that in the previous uh, video, but John Locke's view on natural rights and the role of government. And so what the Declaration of Independence is, um, you know, quite simply, it's a breakup letter. It's a Dear John letter, except it's Dear George. We're breaking up with you, and it starts with the introduction of we're going to break up with you, and then it goes right into the grievances, and this is why. And it outlines every reason why they are basically declaring their independence. Now, it's going to be a tough sell. Like I said, a lot of the uh, colonies aren't quite sure where they fall. I mean, obviously, Boston is all for this, but what about if you live in South Carolina or what if you live in Georgia? Are you willing to go to war against Great Britain? This is when Thomas Paine's uh, pamphlet, Common Sense, comes out. And Thomas Paine basically, you know, well, it came out in January, but basically people are reading it during this whole time. So when the Declaration comes out, he's given basically a common man analogy of why they should declare their independence from England. And so that's exactly what's going to happen. They get a unanimous consensus that all 13 colonies would sign the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, now now the fight is on. I mean, we, we we're already fighting. I should point out that George Washington actually was originally at the Second Continental Congress, but he was appointed as the commander of the colonial army. So he is leading that force right now um, while the declaration is being drafted. When we get to, sorry about that, when we get to the actual war, what you really need to know is Saratoga, the importance of Saratoga and how it was a turning point in the war. Basically, the victory of Saratoga for the uh, the colonists is going to lead to the um, alliance of France being developed. France was watching to see how this war was going to go. When we defeated England at, at Saratoga, that's when France joined. The Marquis de Lafayette came in, started training our soldiers. We not only got uh, uh, financial help, we got uh, weapons, we got uh, military help. So this was definitely the turning point. The other battle, honestly, you need to know, the Battle of Yorktown. That's the final battle of the American Revolution. Now, one thing I want to point out, I have it down in the left corner there, if you can probably barely see it. There, were, there was a time after the Battle of Saratoga when General Cornwallis of the uh, uh, English forces focused his, the fighting down in the south. He, you know, we don't talk a lot about the, the fighting in the south, but there was quite a bit of fighting but it, it, didn't, it didn't inflict much damage. And that's gonna lead us to Yorktown, which is in Virginia. Uh, we're able to defeat the English there. The English do surrender. And at, once we signed the Treaty of Paris in 1783, you can see the map there on the bottom right. The United States is now its own country. And we extend from the uh, Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Mississippi River. That's going to lead us into our next two decades. The age of the republic is what I refer to it. So we're this new country, but the question is, now what? During the American Revolution, we had actually drafted a government. We were under the Articles of Confederation. And what you need to know about the Articles of Confederation is this. They were very weak. I think uh, Hip Hughes... Um, Basically, the, the, the catchphrase he uses is the Articles of Confederation sucked because the Fed was too weak. And that basically captures it all right there. Our federal government had no power. So when we talk about um, the Articles of Confederation, this is what you need to know. You need to know that we had no executive branch. There was no president at this time. We had no judicial branch. All we had was a legislature. And we had no national supremacy. It was what we call a confederation, a, a, a loose agreement between friends, if you will. It's very similar to the um, European, European Union today, um, where we're, 
we have this this union, but no one really has any power. There's not a, there's there's not a go-to guy, I guess, if you will. And this is really exemplified with Shay's Rebellion. Shay's Rebellion, you definitely need to know that because what that is dealing with is the rising up of, of farmers in Western Pennsylvania, I believe. Um, I don't remember exactly, but uh, they were they were angry about property taxes, so they storm the uh, I was Massachusetts. I'm sorry. They stormed the courthouse and they basically shut it down. And Massachusetts has no way of calling in an army to help them because we don't have a national army. So they end up having to hire an army to put down Shay's Rebellion. Well, this is going to show us that we have a lot of problems with our current government. So what we're going to do is in 1787, we're going to meet, bring all the, all the states now together and have the Constitutional Convention. The Constitutional Convention, the idea was that these men were going to come together and amend the Articles of Confederation. But when it got right down to it, they just needed to trash the Articles and start fresh. And so you have two drafted plans coming in. You have the Virginia plan and you have the New Jersey plan. And the big topics of debate at the Constitutional Convention was representation and slaves. To, to get this through, there was a, the, what's known as the Great Compromise. And the Great Compromise took the best of both the Virginia and New Jersey plan. And the, Virginia, or the, the Great Compromise did this. It created a bicameral legislature where the Senate would have equal representation. That comes from the New Jersey plan. Where, and the House is going to have representation based on population. That's going to come... Um, that's that's going to come from the Virginia plan. So when you put you know these two together, the idea of representation, that's how we get our two house legislative government that we have now. This they also created an executive branch and a judicial branch. So not only did they create a bicameral legislature, they created a government which which had separation of powers because the idea was each one of these levels of government, the legislative branch, the executive, and the judicial branch would all have equal power. And they'd also have checks on one another to make sure someone wasn't taking advantage or gaining too much power. Um, the Constitution was a tough sell, honestly. It, they need, they, they, one thing they got away from with the Articles of Confederation is they didn't need unanimous approval. They needed nine of the 13 states to approve the Constitution. And the one state they focused on was New York because New York kind of guides the rest of the colonies. And that's when Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay came together to write the Federalist Papers. And the Federalist Papers are a series of essays that discuss the, re you know, basically break down the Constitution and discuss why it's going to work and what's, you know, and how it's going to work. It, I mean, there's essays about separation of powers. There's essays about um, uh, the, the executive branch. Federalist 10 is, is warning against factions. And what's interesting about this is when you look at Madison and Hamilton, you should know that Madison's later going to become an ally of Thomas Jefferson, where he's going to become a Democratic Republican. And we know that Alexander Hamilton was a Federalist. But both of these men, though, they had completely opposite viewpoints of, of you know, how the government should run as far as size and stuff. Because let's face it, Hamilton wanted to see the government run more like a monarchy. Whereas Madison was looking at it more for, you know, the people were going to run it. So they come from two totally different sides, but they both see the importance of passing the Constitution. You did have a group of anti-federalists at this time um, who, who also wrote essays, but eventually New York does ratify the Constitution and the Constitution becomes the law of the United States in 1787. So you need to remember that. Um, one thing you also need to remember, these two guys right here, let me back up, they're down there at the bottom, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams were not at the Constitutional Convention. I about died the other day when we were listening to the presidential videos and they were talking about John Adams at the Constitutional Convention. He was not there. So please do not refer to Jefferson or Adams when it comes to talking about the Constitution. Once the Constitution is ratified, we elect our first president. Our first president is going to be George Washington, elected unanimously. Uh, John Adams, the runner-up, 
will be elected his vice president. Now, Washington has an interesting task ahead of him because no one has ever been president of the United States before. So what he does for our country is he sets the precedence of how the executive branch is going to work. One of the first areas that he is able to establish executive power is with the Whiskey Rebellion. Very similar to Shays Rebellion, um, is you had farmers in western Pennsylvania rising up against a whiskey tax. And they try to pull the same thing. They're, they're yelling, no taxation without representation, all the things we like to yell all the time. And Washington actually assembled an army, took that army into Pennsylvania, and put down the rebellion. And the importance of the Whiskey Rebellion is it shows us the strength of the Constitution. It works. So here's what, you know, here's another great opportunity for um, synthesis. You could talk about uh, Shays Rebellion and uh, whisk, the Whiskey Rebellion. Both rebellions were, you know, uh, Americans rising up against what they thought were unfair taxes. However, Shays Rebellion is going to show us how weak the Articles of Confederation are, while the uh, Whiskey Rebellion is going to show us how strong the new Constitution is. It's also going to show us the power of the executive branch, um, George Washington basically using the power that the Constitution is going to grant him. Another thing when you look at Washington's presidency, I want you to pay attention to his cabinet. He is the first to create a cabinet. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that Washington needed a cabinet. It, it talked about presidential advisors, but there was no real um, explanation of how you're going to get that done. Washington picked probably the strongest cabinet we have ever had. He had Thomas Jefferson as the Secretary of State, Alexander Hamilton as the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Henry Knox as the Secretary of War, and Edmund Randolph as his Attorney General. The big thing that is accomplished with the uh, cabinet is going to be the financial system of our country. Um, you're going to see Alexander Hamilton develop our financial system. He's going to develop the first national bank. He's going to come up with a plan to pay back the debt from the war. Um, but he's going to have some detractors, primarily uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. And both of these men are basically going to fight him every step of the way until they are able to reach a compromise. And that compromise is going to be they will back Hamilton's financial plan if he will back moving the capital to a southern state. And it was at this time that the capital was going, to, you know, it was determined it was eventually going to be moved to Washington, D.C. You got to know at the time, Washington, D.C. was a big old swamp. Um, but uh, Washington, uh, the, the president, is going to take to developing the plans for the new capital, and they're going to start building it uh, uh, right away. Um, finally, when we talk about Washington's presidency, we got to talk about his farewell address. Now, Washington set a lot of precedents during his presidency. One of the big precedents he set was leaving after two terms. That's why we refer to him as the American Cincinnatus. He just twice now he has given up power. He gave up power following the American Revolution, and now he's giving up power following his second term in office. He just wants to go home to Mount Vernon and be a farmer. And so, but during his farewell address, he issues several warnings to the people of the United States. And those warnings include avoid a national debt. Now, Alexander Hamilton is working on their debt at that time, but Washington can see the problem with an escalating debt. He wards against parties. Make no mistake, guys. Parties were already in place at this point. You already had the division between the Federalist and the Jeffersonian Republicans. Washington's just warning, saying these factions are going to kill, you know, basically hurt the country. And then the big one that he warns us against that we've talked about over and over again is avoiding foreign entanglements, basically staying out of foreign business. During Washington's presidency, um, I didn't mention this, but you want to be familiar with the fact that we were being pushed to coming into the French Revolution. They had helped us during our American Revolution. Now they're asking for the same in return. Jefferson pushed for our involvement in that revolution. But Washington actually said no, 
and issued the proclamation of neutrality, which basically said we are staying out of that war. That proclamation was actually written by Alexander Hamilton. So um, that's another precedent that Washington's going to set, is basically we're going to stay out of foreign entanglements, and that's going to last for almost 100 years. I mean, until we get to the Spanish-American War, we stay out of all foreign wars. So, but that's going to be the end of Washington's presidency, and that's going to take us into the end of the 1790s and the presidency of John Adams, which you can describe as the good, the bad, and the sad. When you talk about John Adams, poor guy, how does anybody follow George Washington? Why would anybody want to? But John Adams did. He was elected president. Thomas Jefferson, the runner-up, was list, uh, was came on as his vice president. We're still dealing with the issue in France and the war and um, the problem with the fact that our ships are being overtaken by the French and English. We actually went into a quasi-war with the French, meaning that we never declared war, but we were definitely in a naval war with the French during the late 1790s. In fact, you can credit John Adams with being the father of our modern Navy because he did build up the Navy to help prevent, um, you know, to, to protect our merchants as they went across the ocean. He sent a, a, a contingency of men, not a contingency, but a, a group of men over to negotiate a peace with France. What happened was when they get there, we know it was the XYZ affair. They are basically bribed in order to meet with the foreign minister. They come back and, uh, you know, Adams is like, you got to be out of your mind. I'm not giving you one cent for tribute. And so that's what's good. He handled the XYZ affair great. However, the next thing he did, the, the, the Adams and the Alien and Sedition Act. We were worried about, I guess, French infiltration into our country. We were worried about French, French sympathizers coming in and drawing the sympathy of the nation. And so what Adams does is he passes the Alien and Sedition Act. The purpose of these acts was to protect us from French infiltration. The Alien Act basically adds more years that someone has to live here before they become a citizen. I think it went from 7 to 14. And the Sedition Acts makes it illegal to speak out against the government, whether verbally or in the press. I mean, he predominantly focused on the press, but he basically suppressed uh, freedoms that were guaranteed in the Bill of Rights. And so the Sedition Acts are going to basically go down in history as this horrible thing that, um, that John Adams is going to do with regards to suppressing rights of the American. He's not the first, he's not gonna be the last one to do this. Let's jump ahead to uh, um, Lyndon B. Johnson during the Vietnam War and his Sedition Acts. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about Truman and his Sedition Acts. It's going to happen. And so it, it kind of ex exemplifies the power of the presidency. When the national security is threatened, their power increases uh, based on their, their role as commander in chief. And John Adams was no different. The bad part or the sad part of Adams' presidency is going to be the appointment of midnight judges. Just before he leaves office, um, Adams uh, appoints, oh, I don't know how many Federalist judges to benches all over the country. And the whole purpose of this is to keep, maintain the Federalist influence in our country. It's pretty clear that um, we are, our country is, is drifting away from the Federalist Party and the Jeffersonian Republicans are starting to rise up. And so what Je Adams does is he's going to appoint a lot of these judges for lifetime um, uh, appoint, appointments on the bench and so as he leaves he has a lot of judges who are taking place a lot of judges who are waiting for their papers which is going to lead to a conflict or a, um, a conflict but a controversy with the Marshall Court under Thomas Jefferson which we will talk about in our next lecture so that's it guys um, that's period three there's obviously a lot more still in there. I didn't talk about the Bill of Rights much. That was a compromise that was made to get the anti-federalists to get on board 
with the Constitution. They agreed to support the Constitution as written as long as a, a Bill of Rights was added to it, which Madison is going to draft right away. The Bill of Rights is going to take effect in 1791. But these are just the big ideas you need to know. So that's the end of period three coming up. Period four. We'll get that one up as soon as we can. Hope you guys are having a great weekend. Um, happy studying, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.